In the following program, made possible by a major grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, National Public Radio presents three very distinguished Americans, together with a moderator, a narrator, and an audience of townspeople. In historical alphabetical order, Aaron Burr, played by Jack Lemmon. I happen to think woman is a glorious species. Alexander Hamilton, played by Lloyd Bridges. No one can say we don't live in raucous times. Thomas Jefferson, played by William Shatner. Never place too much confidence in any one man, myself included. As John Lennox, moderator, Martin Landau. Anything is possible in love, war, and politics. And as narrator, Bonnie Grice. One may well suspect a latent, if not active, antipathy toward each other. All appearing in No Love Lost, written and directed by Norman Corwin. You are invited to do what you've done countless times. Suspend your disbelief. But not all the way because most of what you will hear in the next hour was actually said or done by three great American revolutionaries. The events and conditions they deal with, their feelings about each other, their positions, their arguments, are all matters of record. The only license taken is that of the occasion that brings them together before a public audience on an evening in the fall of 1799. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am John Lennox of the Open View Society, which has arranged this presentation. I want to thank you for having come through the rain to this hall, whose roof must rank among the leakiest in Philadelphia. But at least it's a roof under which we're fortunate to be able to bring together in this troubled hour three men whose contribution to our successful revolution and to the fortunes of our country in the 23 years since we declared ourselves a nation in this very city have been as singular as they are distinguished. Today, when many of us fear we'll have to go to war against our recent ally, France, one could not ask for a more illustrious panel. Two of our three guests are leading candidates, respectively, for Vice President and President of the United States. The third has been a general in the Army, Chief Aide to George Washington, and was, until recently, our first Secretary of the Treasury. At dinner tonight, we discussed the plan of the evening, and our guests agreed that they should be free to take up not only the quasi-war with France, that has been going on for some time now, but any other matters of present concern. The procedure would be informal. Each discussant may direct questions to any other. My function is to listen, like yourselves, with the privilege added that in the event of pitched battle, I may act as truce negotiator. I have first the honor to present a man considered by many the most likely to be elected next Vice President of the United States, a man who fought with distinction in our war of independence, who participated in the attack on Quebec, a brave and resourceful soldier who returned from battle to become Attorney General of the State of New York, and now its Senator, Colonel Aaron Burr. As becomes an officer, Colonel Burr, who is now entering, carries himself with dignity and self-command. He's handsome, short, slim, partly balding. He looks younger than his 49 years. Next, it's my privilege to introduce a man who has but lately retired to the private practice of law after serving many of the pressing needs of our country almost from the day he arrived at the age of 16 from his native island of Nevis in the West Indies. His military career and his administration of the Treasury under Presidents Washington and Adams have made him a legend among legends. Ladies and gentlemen, General Alexander Hamilton. The general, who like Senator Burr has kept a trim figure, is still very handsome in his 40s. Also, like Mr. Burr, he dresses impeccably, a long blue coat with bright buttons, black small clothes. And now he settles into one of the four chairs on the platform. And our third guest, a gentleman from Virginia, once governor of that state, author of the Declaration of Independence, ambassador to France, and for the past three years, vice president of the United States, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. 
At 56, Mr. Jefferson is the oldest of the three, but you'd hardly know it. He has very little gray in his reddish hair. In contrast to the others, he's almost casually dressed. He nods in acknowledgement of the applause and goes straight to his chair. Now, if our guests are comfortably ensconced... Mr. Lennox. Colonel Bauer. Do I understand correctly that we appear on this platform as discussants? Yes, uh, we had for a time contemplated calling ourselves the Discussant Company, but settled for Open View Society as being more euphonious. Uh, well, I'm glad you changed the name. I'd be uneasy about being a Discussant because words that end in A-N-T bother me. <laughs> they seem to be working for no good cause, you know, like uh, supplicant, mendicant, Miscreant, defendant, pollutant, yeah. expectorant. Well, I suppose the only ant word that has any grandeur to speak of is elephant. <laughs> well, that would no doubt disappear as soon as the meaning became one who elves. <laughs> now that we've had a meeting of three great American minds on the demeaning power of the suffix ant, I make bold to suggest that we move on to some slightly more substantive issue, like, say, our Troubles with France. Oh, not yet, sir. The effect of the wine at dinner is still with us. Give us another round of persiflage before we attack or defend President Adams for keeping us so far out of a hot war with France. Well, there's a motion before the House for another round of persiflage. Do I hear a second? Second. <laughs> Adopted by acclamation. All right, Mr. Lennox. Suggest a point of small consequence. Well, I don't know how small its consequence may be, but may I propose that General Hamilton tell you about the time he was stoned? You were stoned? No, it was at a public meeting on Wall Street, and uh, someone threw a stone, hit me on the head. One of my friends said that uh, the Republicans were trying to knock out my brains in order to reduce me to equality with them. <laughs> Uh, perhaps no stones are being thrown, but has there ever been a time when people called each other so many foul names? Men of Jefferson's persuasion are infidels, anarchists, tools of France, jackals, skunks, and cannibals. At the same time, Mr. Hamilton's party consists of pettifoggers, British bootlickers, and wretches who'd sell their lord for 30 glasses of rum. I've seen every one of those terms in the press. Well, no one can say we don't live in raucous times. Well, freedom is always raucous. It's despotism that seems calm, because under it, no one dares make any noise. Gentlemen, let's get to the matter of the undeclared war that has generated so much noise lately. May I begin by saying that although I have had many occasions to differ with President John Adams, I give him full credit for having resisted so far, the pressure of the hawks in his Federalist constituency to plunge us into war against the one country in the world that stood by us in our own revolution. You don't think France should be punished for raiding American ships, for insulting our envoys, for threatening to hang American sailors? I just think it would be criminal to declare war against an old friend who has temporarily gotten out of sorts because of her troubles with England. Yeah. The French may bluster, but they have not yet hanged any American sailor, and they are not I going to. I don't hold with you, Mr. Vice President. 340 American ships were seized by French privateers last year, and property losses ran very high. General Hamilton would know the figures, I'm sure. $55 million. Uh. And growing. Well, what about that recent battle between French and American frigates in the West Indies? Well, the French ships surrendered. That should satisfy our hawks for a while. Well, I confess to a certain agitation when excuses are made for the effrontery of the French. Let's not forget that our diplomats were not even given a hearing by them. Instead, we were confronted by three agents identified only by the letters X, Y, and Z, and made to understand that unless we come across with a quarter of a million dollars, we might as well turn around and go home. Uh, really now, with whom do they think they're dealing? Some weak, vacillating, pusillanimous state in the backwaters of Europe? And why are they sulking? Because we refuse to get roped into their war with Britain? I'm sure the French remember, if you don't, that they did not refuse to get involved in our war with Britain. Must we be eternally grateful for that? Yeah. 
They helped us not so much out of love for us as out of hatred for England. Besides, France has no business carping because we signed a treaty with the British five years ago. As though we haven't a right as a sovereign nation to settle our affairs in our own way and to our advantage without asking their leave. Just a moment. It's through the help of France that we exist as a nation. If, God forfend, we go to war against her, it would be like... A son fighting against his father. Oh, that's a touching thought, but this is no time for sentiment. So what do you propose to do about it? How do you rid us of worms? If France will not conciliate, then peace is to be had not by negotiation, but by the sword. I agree with General Hamilton's announced recommendations. Perhaps the general would be good enough to state for this audience what those recommendations are. To increase our army from its present strength of 3,500 men to 50,000, and to double the size of the Navy. Is it Good. true you've also proposed that any militiaman who refuses service shall be put in prison? That's correct. Well, 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 what a wicked use is made of the XYZ business cooked up, as it was by well-off patrons in Mr. Hamilton's party, or even now, arousing the country against the terrible French. It seems that not quite the same notice given to the fact that the French government is sincere in its disposition for peace and that it does not want us to break the British treaty and is willing to arrange a liberal one with us. I believe the American people will soon realize they've been duped. The truth of the matter is that a scandalous war between the only two republics on this earth has been avoided principally by the restraint France has shown. I'm not at all persuaded. Indeed, I'm compelled to ask you bluntly, Mr. Jefferson, are you for peace at any price? I ask the same question. You both know very well I'm not. But war, all war, is too high-priced. There are other ways of punishing injuries than by war, because war punishes the punisher as much as the punished. Are you saying we were punished by our victory over England? <laughs> A great many members of Congress believe it's in our best interest to go to war right now. And the sooner, the better. What a lot of false arithmetic is used to persuade people that it's in their interest to go to war. If the money it costs to satisfy an insult or gain a little territory or the right to cut wood here or catch fish there, if this money was spent making roads, opening rivers, building ports, improving the arts, and finding employment for jobless poor, then all nations would be much stronger, richer, and happier. Apparently, Mr. Jefferson, nothing can awaken you from your famous dream of a perfectible world. I'm with General Hamilton in urging the strongest possible military buildup. I'm for preparation at all costs. It seems, Colonel, that your zeal for arming has not gone unnoticed. You've been criticized by some congressmen for capitulating to what they call Federalist War Fever. I don't care what they say. I'm proud to be serving on a committee for the defense of New York. General Hamilton is a fellow member. That's true. Indeed, I nominated Colonel Burr to be a superintendent of fortifications. The writer James Cheatham, Mr. Burr, has described your attitude as a turnabout as a bid for high rank in the growing military build-up. Oh, is Mr. Cheatham always that entertaining? <laughs> Are you and Mr. Hamilton always this compatible? Well, nobody could possibly mistake us for Damon and Pythias. I don't think the general has ever quite forgiven me for defeating his father-in-law, General Schuyler, for the senatorship of New York. And I never will. <laughs> Actually, Colonel Burr and I have been associated from time to time, once in the practice of law, as co-counsel. Uh -huh. And you may ask the uh, colonel whether differences in our point of view have in any way affected the cordiality of our mutual regard. Not once. Do you remember the case of the people versus Levi I'll Never Reeves? forget it. What, what case was that? We were retained together as defense counsel in a case of the murder of a woman. A young man named Weeks was charged with the murder, and there was a great deal of popular sentiment aroused against our client, but we got him off. Yeah. Thanks in largest part to your work. Oh, you're much too modest. Well, I suppose I must have contributed something to the acquittal because a relative of the murder victim came up to me after the trial and said, if thee dies a natural death, there is no justice in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the privilege of this audience to witness the greatest show of amity ever displayed publicly by Messrs. Hamilton and Burr. Strange and wonderful are the forces that bring adversaries 
together. <laughs> Would you have thought this possible, Mr. Lennox? <laughs> oh, yes. Anything is possible in love, war, and politics. General Hamilton, you were first thrust into prominence by your appointment to be the right hand, so to speak, of the late George Washington. How did it happen at age 20 that Alexander Hamilton was picked as next man to the commander-in-chief? Well, in the fighting around Princeton, I apparently came to the personal notice of the general. Later, when he needed help in drafting documents and executing orders, he looked for someone who knew military tactics and who, like himself, was a disciplinarian. So, well, he offered me the post of his aide. Of course you jumped at it. No, not quite. <laughs> it was enormously flattering, naturally, but uh, well, I preferred the smell of powder to the smell of ink. Still, one can hardly be cavalier about an invitation from the commander-in-chief to be his aide. No, I was not cavalier, just young. <laughs> General, concerning your preference for the smell of powder, some of your critics say you were, and are, overfond of war. Do they now? I must say I've heard that too, General. It's been suggested that you were at times uh, careless with the lives of men under your command. Now that, sir, is a serious charge. I insist you be specific. I would rather not. We've been getting along fairly well up to this point. <laughs> Repeating a canard in public is not my idea of an anxiety to get along well. I cannot let such a statement Rest. Well, I don't have any evidence before but me. I thought not. Wasn't there some incident involving troops under your command at the Battle of Yorktown? Well, in battle, there tend to be many incidents involving troops. I see Mr. Uh, Lennox is searching feverishly through his papers. Perhaps he has in his hands, amongst what I presume to be sheaves of documents on all our nefarious activities, something that could illuminate us on this point? As a matter of fact, I do have. Permit me. Mr. Lennox has risen from his chair to hand a piece of paper to Mr. Hamilton. The general, who seems quite annoyed, refuses to accept it. Perhaps Mr. Burr would like no, to read No, I defer to Mr. Jefferson, who, after all, raised the possibility that the document could be with us. And uh, I defer to Mr. Lennox, since he realized the possibility. <laughs> well, since I... Uh... Didn't bring up the matter, and since no one... Uh... Aren't we all being terribly coy? Why don't you read it out loud, Mr. Lennox? There being no objection... It seems that a certain Captain James <clears throat> Duncan indicates he served under you, sir, in the Battle of Yorktown. Claims that after a successful action in the field, you called for an extraordinary maneuver. Oh, and what was that? He wrote that you advanced your men to a parapet where you commanded them to go through the whole soldier's manual, presenting and grounding arms in full sight of the enemy. Well, then why didn't the British fire on us? According to the captain, and now I quote him, Although the enemy had been firing a little before, they did not now give us a single shot. I suppose their astonishment at our conduct must have prevented them, for I can assign no other reason. Colonel Hamilton gave those orders, and although I esteem him highly, I must beg leave in this instance to think he wantonly exposed the lives of his men. The operative phrases in the captain's comment are, I suppose, and I beg leave to think. You have quoted an opinion of a recollected event, and the author is entitled to think whatever he begs leave to think. But uh, while we're on the subject of an officer's concern for his troops, I have heard the story, Colonel Burr, that you nearly cut off the arm of one of your own soldiers. Oh, that's true, General. Yeah. Well, somehow, Colonel, I don't think you can quite leave the story there. No, no. <laughs> You see, during the days of Valley Forge, you may recall, there was poor morale in the army, and there were desertions, there were soldiers whose terms of enlistment had expired, and who refused to re-enlist. Now, around that time, a detachment of militia was ordered to protect a pass ten miles from Valley Forge, perhaps out of oh, boredom, or bitterness, malicious humor, they took to sending back frequent false alerts word that the British were on the march. This, of course, would arouse the sleeping main camp, and it was very disruptive, as you can imagine. Well, since I had become known, like General Hamilton, as a disciplinarian, I was assigned to straighten out that militia. I took over command of it and issued very strict orders that did not sit well with the thugs and mischief makers in the force. As a result, they planned to get rid of me. What do you mean, get rid of you? Just that. 
kill you? Yeah. Luckily for me, I found out about it and devised a plan of my own. Unknown to them, I had all the bullets removed from their weapons. And one midnight, very cold, moonlit night, I had the company awakened and mustered for a roll call. Carrying their arms? Yes. But uh, you knew their arms were not loaded? Not loaded. I just said that. Were were you armed? Only with a saber. May I go on? Well, me. As I inspected the troops, I stopped in front of each man, and when I came to the ringleader, he raised his gun, leveled it at me, and shouted, Now's the time, boys! Instantly, I came down hard with my saber and slashed his arm, and I all but cut it off. I then dismissed the men, and that was the end of it. And what of the arm? Amputated next morning. You don't mind telling that story? You seem to forget I was asked to do so. (laughs) And may I add, after that, there were no more false alarms. I believe our friend from Virginia never had any problems with matters such as troop discipline. Am I mistaken? No, General, that is right. I was never in uniform. Mm -hmm. Having been engaged in other matters, my closest brush with enemy soldiers was being pursued by them during my days as governor of Virginia. Perhaps I anticipate you, General, in bringing up that incident. Oh, no, I dare say it is sufficiently well known without my bringing it up. Your uh, flight before enemy troops has been characterized, well, in terms uh, which, of course, I do not support, as a show of cowardice by a state leader. I'm not sure about you, Mr. Lennox, but the rest of us on this platform are more or less accustomed to calumny. The event of which Mr. Hamilton speaks has been interpreted in some quarters to suggest that I, ignoring the noble example of Don Quixote and his windmill, declined single combat in my doorway against an entire force of British dragoons. Let's get back to George Washington. (laughs) Mr. Burr, you knew him, did you not? I did. I found him a rather cold and haughty man. He could be that. He could be that on occasion. Well, we can all be that on occasion. But uh, usually the occasion is inspired by something. Uh, Colonel, did you not have some difference with the commander? Well, difference Hmm. depends on who does the differing and why. My first relation to General Washington came soon after I volunteered for service. He had received two letters strongly proposing that I be given a commission in the Army. One of them was from John Hancock. Mr. Washington did not see fit to honor those requests. Well, isn't it true that at the time, commissions were given only by the states, that the general did not have the authority yeah, to well, appoint Yeah, that may them? have been a factor then, but it would not explain his denial several times of later commissions. He found it convenient each time to obstruct my progress by withholding promotions and assignments. Perhaps he had some help on that from close advisors. D- did you ever actually meet General Washington? Oh, yes, several times. Uh, Once, I heard, under uh, strained circumstances. Any meeting with George Washington was a strained circumstance. (laughs) I believe you know to what I refer. I think not. The letter on his desk. Oh, well, 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 I I have no compunction about telling that story. The general had sent for me, and when I entered the room, he was at his desk writing. He made a sign for me to be seated, and he kept on writing for a little. Then he excused himself, and he went out of the room. Now, I was burning with curiosity to see what a letter from the great man looked like. So I sidled up to his desk, and I peeked. So once I'd gotten that far, I got interested in what he had written and started to read it. At which point, of course, the general suddenly returned and caught me at it. He exploded. He was livid. Gave me the tongue lashing of my life. (laughs) But wasn't that unbecoming conduct on your part? No, not unbecoming, just young. (laughs) I dare say I deserved what I got, but I don't think it should have put me on his enemy list from that time forward. Oh, I wouldn't agree with you on that designation. The general seemed to me not the grudge-holding type. Obviously, you didn't like him. But what did you think of him as a general, militarily speaking? Would you like to withdraw that question? No. Well, I'm afraid I must answer frankly. He was not a good general. In his whole career, he was associated almost entirely with defeat. He had nothing to do with our one important victory before Yorktown, which was Saratoga, where General Gates was in command. As for Yorktown, where would Washington have been without the guns of the French fleet? I perceive, Colonel, that nothing could possibly change your estimate of the man. Nor yours, I'm sure. Mr. Jefferson, 
I feel secure in the presumption that if you had done nothing else but compose a declaration of independence, your prospects for the esteem of posterity would be secure. Thank you. How did you feel when you crossed the last T and set down the last period of the declaration? Tired. <laughs> Actually, I felt tentative about what I'd set down because I was convinced that the draft would be revamped by Congress, resisted, haggled over, picked apart. And that's what happened. It was attacked from the first sentence. By who in particular? Just about everyone. Including a congressman from my own state, Mr. Nicholson. Uh. He berated the assertion that all men are created equally as vehement as an open invitation to civil convulsion, said all men were not born free and equal, and that we should not weaken our first national pronouncement to the world by so stating. Wasn't there also a ruckus over your calling for the abolition of the slave trade? Yes. Yeah. Even some who, like myself, wanted to get rid of slavery, argued that if we insisted on it in the Declaration, the southern colonies might split from the rest of us before we got started, right there and then. How much of your original text was dropped? 480 words, 86 changes. How many words unchanged? 1,337. Very tidy bookkeeping. Since I was not accustomed to being rewritten by a room full of men, I kept careful and grudging account. But the framing of the Declaration is a long story, Mr. Lennox, and I assume that you'd like to steer us back to more recent events. You read my mind. Gentlemen, among the problems facing our country today, other than that of France, which do you consider the sorest? The Alien and Sedition Acts, by a wide margin, the trend toward conformity, the putting down of dissent, the existence on the statute books of a series of gross, unworkable, and unjust laws. As I agree, the acts are intrusive, excessive, and altogether repressive. What evidence do you have of this? Will personal evidence do? My mail has been opened in Philadelphia. Some of my supporters have been threatened. Others have been shadowed on the streets and their movements recorded. And not a word of protest from the Federalists? None. How does this sit with you, Mr. Hamilton? Well, I had and still have some reservations about those acts. But then, uh, well, I never expect to see perfection in a creature as imperfect as man. I am not speaking of perfectibility. I'm speaking about a threat to our rights. Under these laws, the president can, at any time, deport such aliens as he, he, judges to be dangerous. And if an alien returns after deportation, he can be imprisoned and kept there for as long as the president likes. The whole thing is obviously aimed at the foreign-born. Well, sir, I am foreign-born. Oh, come on, Mr. Hamilton. You know very well you Federalists are against the foreign-born. It's because, as a rule, they're against you as Federalists. Uh, so why should that be? Why should that be unless... They've been assiduously educated by Mr. Jefferson's faction to be hostile. No education has been necessary. They're against your faction because most of them came to this country to escape the tyranny of crowned heads and mischief-making aristocrats, and they are fully aware... Sir, it was not aristocrats who made all the misery in the France you so slavishly admire. Was it aristocrats? who invented the guillotine and kept it busy decapitating former friends of yours among the aristocracy? Friends who had been very kind to you when you were ambassador to France? I'm afraid we're straying somewhat afield. Mr. Hamilton, let me ask your opinion about the sentencing to prison of Congressman Lyon of Vermont for criticizing President Adams. Very rough specimen of democracy is Mr. Lyon. Any congressman who would spit in the face of a colleague on the floor of Congress... He had been slandered by Senator Griswold on the same floor, and moreover, Griswold followed him and kept plucking at his coat. Congressman Lyon was not jailed for spitting, but for criticizing the president. Four months in prison and a fine for a thousand dollars. Which fine you helped to pay, I believe. That is correct. Uh, did you not, Mr. Burr, also support a gentleman accused of seditious libel? Mm -hmm. One Mr. Burr? I certainly did. I contributed to his bail of 2,000. Uh, wasn't he the same Mr. Burke who escaped from Ireland disguised as a woman? Yes, and he was the same Mr. Burke who wrote a very popular play about Bunker Hill and dedicated it to me. I hope you've seen the play, Mr. Hamilton. It's still performed. Well, I've not yet had the pleasure. Mm -hmm. I uh, believe Mr. Burke is in hiding somewhere now, is he not? I don't keep the same watch on private citizens that the Adams administration seems to do. I don't know where the man is. Perhaps in view of the time left, we should mine some other vein. Mr. Jefferson, you were Secretary of State and Mr. Hamilton was Secretary of Treasury in the Cabinet of President Washington. 
It's well known that relations between your departments were very strained. Was there personal animosity between the two of you? No, 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 not personal. But I must say there were some rather pronounced administrative differences. What were the differences? Since Sander seems rampant here tonight, let me just say that the State Department tried to persuade Mr. Washington to remove the post office from the control of Treasury. Now, friend Jefferson did not succeed there, but he did manage to get the mint under his control, which certainly astonished us at the Treasury. I am sorry to be compelled to reply that Mr. Hamilton, as Secretary of the Treasury, performed more like a Prime Minister in that he became involved in every aspect of government, including foreign affairs, which was the exclusive province of the State Department. He met unilaterally with foreign representatives, especially British diplomats, without my knowledge. I'm afraid you misapprehend. You had a staff of over a hundred. I was obliged to operate with a staff of only five. After a while, I began to think that the Treasury possessed so much influence as to swallow up the whole of the government's executive powers. Well, I have no apology to make for the fact that Treasury, under my charge, was the most vital of the federal department. Well, it still is. Besides management of revenue, it runs the lighthouse service, regulates aid to navigation, conducts land surveys, controls certain medical programs. The only legitimate complaint to all this activity would be if any of these things were done badly. And those complaints have never been heard. What was your total budget in the State Department, Mr. Jefferson? $6,600 a year. Oh, surely you are joking. Mr. Hamilton can verify that. And what did that cover? It covered the operating expenses of the State Department, including the salaries of myself and my staff. For a year? For a year. That wasn't much money to run a government department. That's uh, you, right. You must remember that we were a poor country. Before we even got started, we were $85 million in debt. All the more credit to you, Mr. Hamilton, for so swiftly putting the country on solid ground. Oh, at last, a kind word. May I ask you a candid question, sir? I hadn't noticed that any of the questions asked heretofore were exactly veiled, but go ahead. Is it possible that since your foreign birth made you ineligible for the presidency, you may have, without being altogether aware of it, tried to acquire as much power as you could manage short of the highest seat itself? I have been perfectly aware at all times of the goals for which I have striven, and personal power was not one of them. Hmm. Now, if you're speaking of acquiring power for the nation, then I cheerfully confess to that ambition. I hope that answers your question with as much candor as went into the asking of it. I have no way of measuring, but thank you. <laughs> Speaking of candor, Mr. Hamilton, I have another question involving a matter you yourself made public. It occurred during your administration of the Treasury. I refer to the Reynolds affair. Uh-oh. It's as though a bomb has dropped. General Hamilton's face is flushed. He's obviously very angry. He seems to be counting before he answers. I, uh, had thought that you might have a good taste not to bring that up. But nobody could have cast more intense light on it than you yourself by writing and publishing this pamphlet which I hold in my hand entitled Observations on Certain Documents in Which the Charge of Speculation Against Alexander Hamilton is Fully Refuted. Mr. Lennox. General Hamilton is now on his feet. I apparently have been deceived as to the nature of this event. You carry a small library of documents with you, and so far I see you have taken pains to include an attack on me by an obscure army captain based on an incident more than 20 years ago. And now, the pamphlet. If I had understood that this was going to be a General, kangaroo court... General, we are dealing with history, and it is to your honor that both your personal and public life interact with the past and ongoing history of the United States. I felt that I since... I see no reason to walk. I can understand Mr. Hamilton taking offense at what might be construed under the circumstances as an invasion of his privacy. I think we should try to understand that. I am in no need of special understanding. What I need is to cool my anger, for which I make no apology. 
Mr. Hamilton has left, and Mr. Lennox seems undecided what to do. He looks at Colonel Burr and Mr. Jefferson for some cue, but both are silent. Mr. Lennox is getting up and now comes forward to address the audience. I assure you, it was not my intention to... to... Perhaps we can all profit from, from a recess. A general absent without leave? I think the general is coming back. Yes, here is Mr. Hamilton back on the platform. He's coming forward to speak as Mr. Lennox returns to his seat. Ladies and gentlemen, I felt the need to cool my anger, and that has been done. I had thought that this presentation was one in which the public could hear our views on issues of abiding interest to the nation. God knows there are enough such issues, but no. There was brought up, without warning, reference to an indiscretion that I committed involving a woman whose husband attempted to blackmail me. Now, oh, just how this relates to the past or future of the United States, as the moderator put it, escapes me. Now, while I may be loath to respond to some things I'm not afraid to, which is a different matter entirely, I will not evade any questions asked of me, even one as tasteless as that of Mr. Lennox. Perhaps he will be kind enough to uh, tell us just what it is he wishes to know about the path. Why did you expose to the whole country the circumstances of a protracted adulterous affair with a woman of low character? Why did you choose to publish so much about it, including semi-illiterate letters you received from her, and sordid details of how her husband practiced extortion? Is that the end of the question? Was it necessary to turn all that into the glare of publicity? Anybody could buy your pamphlet, and many did. I did. It was necessary, sir, because my enemies and Mr. Jefferson's party, having invented venomous and highly prejudiced reports, deliberately raised the suspicion that I used my cabinet office and public funds to pay blackmail monies to an extortioner. I was willing to endure the humiliation of openly confessing injury to my private honor rather than suffer the imputation of wrongdoing in my exercise of the Treasury Department. Does my answer satisfy you? I was not seeking satisfaction, only information. Is it now your intention to ask Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Burr about reports of their liaisons? By your standard, all three of us are public figures who interact with history. I don't believe either gentleman has published any confessions. That was the sole ground of my inquiry. Do you have any comment, Mr. Jefferson? Only that perhaps we might profit by moving on to some broader, less personal subject. <laughs> discretion being the better part of procedure, Mr. Vice President? Since I do respect discretion, I'd rather not be pressed to saying anything on the matter you've been entertaining. Oh, I understand so, you had a good deal to say about the matter. Well, not publicly, I didn't. Uh, things that are said privately have a way of becoming public. You seem eager to expedite that process. What I did say privately was that self-exposure of an affair in order to allay suspicion of wrongdoing in office suggested to me that pleading guilty to one offense is not a select way of establishing innocence of another. Are you implying, sir, that... I'm nothing of the kind. I know and the world knows that you are a man of the highest integrity and honesty. My comment was addressed merely to the method of your disavowal. In that respect, it was no more ill-intended than Mr. Lennox's original question, I'm sure. I've been silent up to now because Mr. Jefferson and the General seemed deeply fascinated in what each other had to say. But I cannot dismiss the implication made by Mr. Hamilton that his confreres on this platform have had liaisons which are perhaps subject to scrutiny or at least to comment. I invite Mr. Hamilton to particularize if he feels that by doing so it will contribute to fair play. Oh, very well, Mr. Burr. It has been grist to the tireless mills of gossip that you, sir, have had many affairs with women, some of them of tender age, that your intrigues have been without number. My intrigues were not exactly without number, but I will say that the number was high. <laughs> And I would say that in each instance, discreetness about the particular arrangement was honored more than it is being honored here. I see. Do you, from experience, 
Have any uh, comment to make about the principle of fatherhood outside of wedlock? Well, when a lady does me the honor to name me as the father of her child, I trust I shall always be too gallant to show myself ungrateful for the favor. <laughs> I've heard it said that on a march to Quebec with troops under Benedict Arnold, you were accompanied by an Indian maiden? Only part of the way. <laughs> As she was delectable, an ornament to her race and womankind in general. See, I happen to think woman is a glorious species, that contrary to the fiction held by many men, women are man's intellectual equals. And if it were not for discrimination in education and by custom, they would match us in every endeavor except perhaps war. I see no reason why we should continue to value grace, allure, frivolity, and vanity in a woman above skill, acumen, and intellect. More essay than memoir, Mr. Bird. But I'm sure that your preachment will win you many supporters among the women here tonight. Uh, Mr. Vice President, sir, mm. how do you manage to cope with the ugly rumors that arise from time to time concerning your relationship to a member of your household of slaves on the one hand and with the wife of a friend of your youth on the other. Hmm. I've made it a point never to reply to calumnies. For while I should be answering one, 20 new ones would be invented. Excuse me, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Burr. I should like to make clear to you and to our audience that I regret asking a question which caused offense and which generated this last exchange. If my judgment miscarried, then I am at fault and I apologize. I am particularly sorry if I caused General Hamilton distress, for I have always regarded him with esteem as the man who put our government on its feet. Out of a period of intense turmoil, he succeeded in securing our national credit at home and abroad. His reports are famous for their clarity, scope, and penetration. Really, really, this is not necessary. It is to me, sir. He showed us how to raise and collect revenue. He established a mint and a national bank. Not altogether unopposed. He regulated our currency and laid down our vital guides for industry. And it is to him that a lion's share of the credit must go for ratification of our Constitution. All this is true. But as regards the Constitution, General, is it fair to say you've had and still have many reservations about it? I just don't think it will endure as it stands, but it's necessary. It's a vital compromise between those who, like myself, believe a strong central government is absolutely indispensable, and others who tremble at the idea of a state surrendering the slightest bit of sovereignty to federal authority. You see no chance of an eventual conciliation of the two positions? No. I think there'll always be controversy over the interpretation and application of the Constitution. It will be open to amendments, and amendments to amendments. This subject is long, wide, and deep, and we could go on all night with it, but there are one or two other questions that it might be derelict not to ask while we have the opportunity. First, do any of you doubt that liberty and democracy are compatible? I have no doubt whatsoever. I do. I'm afraid uh, democracy has a way of degenerating into mobocracy. Take what happened in France. The majority sometimes gets drunk with its own power, and when that happens, everything becomes chaotic. I, long ago, advocated that only landowners be permitted to vote for senator. A wealthy senate and president would tend, by their natural conservatism, to check the tendency of the lower house to carry liberty to unhealthy excesses. What you're saying, in effect, is that you're in favor of a perpetual aristocracy. That's what you say I'm saying. It narrows down to a belief in the rule of gentlemen, in the rule of the rich, the good, and the wise. We can tell how rich a man is by his property and credit, but how do you measure goodness and wisdom? Well, oh, those qualities are not so obscure as all that. Hasn't it been your experience that they have a way of shining out? You see, when a man has a certain position, when he has prestige to maintain, then he values honor. He stands above vulgar striving for advantage. 
Aristocracy, I submit, is not a bad word. It depends on the kind of aristocracy. There are two kinds. The natural one, of virtue and talent. And the artificial one, money and title. I've known the latter to do very great mischief in government. And when the rich get too rich and the poor get too poor, there can be a terrible explosion. You and I come from different schools, Mr. Jefferson. Man will always be ambitious and vindictive. A monster at times. Well, it takes more than your pessimism to shake my faith in man's ability to think his way out of trouble. I make allowance for such a thing as progress. Well, I have very strong feelings about the incentive to progress. It may surprise you all. I'm gripping my chair. <laughs> Among the greatest incentives is avarice. Well, I rest my case. Avarice? Do you say that with regret? Not at all. Far from being a deadly sin, avarice is an integral part of the order of nature. The average man's instinct is to make money. His love of money are the main motive forces of the economic machine. When harnessed to the service of the state, avarice can carry a nation to power and opulence. I think we should encourage a spirit of avarice. I happen to place a much higher premium on the spirit of charity and altruism. Oh, well, that sounds very pious, but isn't altruism usually a disguised form of selfishness? How many acts of charity are done out of purity of heart? How many because it soothes the giver's conscience or expiates some guilt or other? I've never made a count. I think it's cynical to believe that guilt is a kind of muse that inspires the best in man. Gentlemen... All about us in the world are old and powerful nations. Do you believe we shall ultimately take our place among the greatest? Beyond any doubt, we are a Hercules in a cradle. No question about it. I share that view. But we must not assume our greatness is inevitable. If we're not careful, we could blunder and forfeit our chance for greatness. If needs are ignored and rights disregarded, People could forget themselves except for the sole faculty of making money. Yeah, ah, but then General Hamilton's theory of avarice would come to the rescue. Yes, I find it refreshing that Mr. Jefferson at last admits people are as capable of being corrupted as they are of being perfected. I have never denied that bad leadership can subvert. In fact, I wish our government could depend less and less on the character of its leaders. Bad men will sometimes get in, and on the strength of immense patronage, they can make a great deal of progress toward corrupting the public mind. To me, the whole art of government consists of being honest. How simple, how pure. And how naive. Scoff, if you please, but to me, the sum of good government is to leave men free to regulate their own pursuits and never take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. Mr. Jefferson, I've come to believe you were endowed with a gift for large abstractions. This talent worked to the benefit of us all, to be sure, in your Declaration of Independence. But your formula for good government is somewhat wanting in particulars. Particulars? Well, you settle for two. Try them on us. One. I believe there should be a limit to the number of terms of a president. If that limit is not fixed by the Constitution or set by practice, the office could become lifelong and degenerate into a kind of royal succession. Two. I would exempt from taxation everyone below a certain level and tax the wealthy in geometrical progression as their wealth increases. And now, don't frighten your audience. This is late at night. Uh, as a point of interest, Mr. Burr, may I ask you the same question that you put to Mr. Jefferson concerning advocacies on your agenda? I invite you to judge from what is already in the log. I advocated doing away with secrecy in the Senate. I introduced a bill to abolish imprisonment for debt and another to impose a tax on unproductive property. I supported a bill to abolish slavery. You want more? I had no idea that you were so full of noble motives. As Virgil said, the noblest motive is the public good, and I think Colonel Burr has just passed that test. Good old Virgil. Let's close on that classic note, but not before asking each whether you have any do's, don'ts, or bewares to recommend to us, Mr. Vice President. Well, to impress on minorities the duties of acquiescence in the will of the majority. And to impress on the majorities a respect at all times for the rights of the minority. Also, to beware of too strong a military force, even of citizens, and 
never to place too much confidence in any one man. Yourself included? Myself included. Mm. General Hamilton. I'd say that in a government framed for durable liberty, as much regard must be paid to the authority to make and execute laws with vigor as to guarding against the encroachment of rights. Colonel Burr? The old Romans had a saying, to enjoy life is to live twice. Therefore, I say enjoy. And I add this amendment, never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. <laughs> May I ask our philosopher why? Because delay may give you a clearer light as to what is best to be done. <laughs> I must try that. Our time is up. I thank you, gentlemen, in behalf of the Open View Society. And I wish to thank our audience for coming out in this weather. I just hope the roads have not melted under the downpour while our esteemed guests have been raining down their opinions. Good night, and drive your carriages safely. The speakers are still on the platform as Messrs. Burr, Jefferson, Hamilton, and Lennox are shaking hands with each other, but, but no, Mr. Hamilton refused to shake hands with Mr. Lennox. He turned his back when Lennox offered his hand and walked off. Well, the general has apparently not forgiven the moderator for bringing up that matter of a woman with whom Mr. Hamilton had an affair. I must say, none of the panelists tonight succeeded in suppressing what one may well suspect is a latent, if not active, acrimony toward each other. I think it's fair to say there was no love lost in this hall tonight. Nor was any love lost in the years that followed this imagined meeting. In 1800, there was a bitter contest between Jefferson and Burr for the presidency. They were tied in electoral votes, and it took 36 ballots in the House of Representatives running over six days before Jefferson was elected president with Burr as vice president. Four years later, Burr killed Hamilton in a duel. And three years after that, Burr found himself tried for treason for allegedly scheming to split the American Southwest from the Union. He was acquitted of that charge to the very great disappointment of still President Thomas Jefferson, who worked very hard for him to be convicted. Although the meeting recounted in this program never actually took place, all opinions and advocacies of the panelists were actually stated by them, often in their exact words. And all incidents and events cited are likewise historically true. From the Museum of Television and Radio in Beverly Hills, you've been listening to Norman Corwin's No Love Lost, starring Jack Lemmon as Aaron Burr, Lloyd Bridges as Alexander Hamilton, William Shatner as Thomas Jefferson, and Martin Landau as John Lennox. Bonnie Grice was the narrator. A cassette copy or script of this program is available at 1-800-411-MIND. That's 1-800-411-MIND. No Love Lost was written and directed by Norman Corwin and produced by Mary Beth Kirshner under the technical direction of Marty Halpern and Warren Dewey. Production support was coordinated by Marge Ostrushko with Janet Lustig, Annie Osborne, John LeBlanc, and The Limousine Connection. Special thanks to Rick Madden, Andy Trudeau, Ken Mueller, and the staff of the Museum of Television and Radio. Production of this program was made possible by a major grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with additional support from the Interrep Radio Store, selling today, innovating for tomorrow, and Novato California-based Sonic Solutions Digital Audio Workstations, it just sounds better, at www.sonic.com. Support for the national distribution of this program comes from National Public Radio member stations, whose contributors include the National Endowment for the Arts and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, helping people to make the arts part of their everyday lives.
This is NPR, National Public Radio.